C'est bon Donc, il faudra que tu le fasses. Allez, ça va être bon. Okay. So I'll try. I'll try stay close, but I cannot promise. Uh, I, I do move a lot. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lydia, for the invitation to present today some parts of uh, our very uh, interesting and uh, innovative project, the Ramones project. I will make. A, we we are eight partners at the moment. One is very much here, uh, doing a very good work. Uh, in in the end of where we're trying to see how whatever we will manage to measure how that affects microorganisms. I do something which is, I'm probably the only one that I'm up in the surface, so everybody has to, to get their feet in the water, but I'm, I'm the one that I'm still out there safely on the beach, uh, zipping uh, pina coladas and trying to, to see if I can communicate anything to to the stakeholders. So... There, there was a very big mission in Milos, and you know, everybody was in uh, swimsuits. I, 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 you know, I, I didn't, you know, I was not there. Uh, stayed safe in Athens uh, behind, you know, the the winds that we were uh, torturing Milos. Okay, so um, we we when when we start discussing about this project, uh, and when I was invited by by Theo to join, I said. Okay, honestly, I don't have anything to contribute here. So I'm, I'm, I am an engineer. Okay, that's that's my scene. I'm an electrical and computer engineer. So I do understand and I am fascinated from projects like that. But physics and biology and microorganisms and, and divers swimming next to a source of radioactivity. I mean, really? Um, so... Um, so Theo, which is the PI, told me that, look... Uh, we will be able to have uh, um, non-stop measurements of, of radioactivity in the water, which is something that has never been done. Uh, and there will be a sense of mobility as well. So we will be able to follow uh, the source if it starts moving. Uh, uh, and I said, great. So if you can measure what's happening in there, then uh, we, we will get whatever standards that are out there about what is the maximum uh, allowed and to, to be absorbed by a human being uh, swimming in the area. Uh, and then I will be able to communicate that to the nearby municipality, like in Marseille, for example, or uh, in uh, Sellafield. So Lancaster and Morecambe up in North UK. And I was very happy, okay, until the three days before we pressed the button for submit. Because then they told me, look, uh, given the, the state of the art and what batteries we have, Actually, we can stay in the water and measure for a week. Okay, so unless a nuclear accident happens during that week, you're going to measure the same thing all week long, more or less. So I was quite puzzled of, of you know, how, how do you, you know, you, you get a new battery, you go down again, you keep on measuring. That's money. Okay, every time you go, get the battery down, get the battery up, that's 20,000 again. So that was one thing that was a little bit... Uh, of what I was thinking of. Then uh, we start discussing with Lydia and said, okay, there, there are no, you know, there's no such thing as established exact measures of what, what if a swimmer is three meters or 10 meters or 23 meters. So we don't know exactly how much will be absorbed. So even that assumption that I will be able to say exactly, okay, that's what I measure, that's what is absorbed 10 meters from there or 10 kilometers from there. So somebody throw the valor with nuclear waste 10 kilometers from the from Marseille, what's happening to swimmers in the beach? Probably nothing, or maybe something. And maybe nothing, but maybe something if they eat the fish that has been swimming next to the source in a nearby taverna. So uh, many things that I, I took for granted as, as, you know, now I'm in a business school. So up there in the business school and say, okay, the physicists and the engineers uh, and the marine biologists will find a way to measure, and they will find a way to measure the damage also in microorganisms, and then Somehow that will come up and then I will start collecting, visualizing and extrapolating and giving forecasts of when maybe annual maximum dosages will be 
So that was the that was the, the initiative. Okay, that's that's how we thought we it would work. Uh, but I said probably no. Okay, so I, I really still don't have anything to contribute here. But then the European Union came up with that idea of environmental intelligence, which um, we, we very actively chase with Theo, Antonio, Lydia, and, and Pavlos. So they said, look, you have to put some money aside and you have to start going. There are five projects that got money in the same call. You have to find a way to talk together and you have to, to see the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is environmental intelligence. So we had also to open the, the books and see what, what, what is that? What do they mean by that? Is that a new term? Is something that exists already there? So today I want to discuss a little bit about that. Okay, so how we end up dealing with that as well, because there is a science, which is how on earth do you measure? How on earth do you know that you measure what is actually there, which is where Lydia and her team is helping a lot, okay, to make sure that whatever these devices are measuring is actually what is there. Uh, but then it goes to, to whom do you inform when you think something is going wrong? And how do you do that? And how fast do you do that? Okay, and then with what kind of systems you do that? So that's the kind of thing of I could I could help a bit, but it's nothing like the science that is happening in the water, much softer things. Uh, 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 but, you know, at the end of the day, the ones that will be informed are the ones giving the money to run this project. So the moment they see practical tools that can help them take decisions, they will be throw more money the core science. So we, we start of trying to create a platform where they will see the benefits of, of, of funding more uh, hard science there. Okay, so I have sent out, uh, uh, which Lydia has disseminated, a, a short abstract of what we're trying to do. Uh, but I will, uh, you know, that, that's it went out already. You've seen the, the snapshot, so I will go into discussing that. Similar. Uh, ideas have been presented uh, in a workshop we've done in Durham, and I, I, as I was discussing with Lydia, we, we will plan to do another one and we'll invite more partners uh, to try see uh, where, where we go with environmental intelligence. Uh, and there I, I went a little bit more about measuring and communicating risks. Okay, um, so I'm based at the moment in, in Durham, okay, in the north of the, or northeast of England, uh, one of the oldest universities in the UK. Uh, that they have a very strong geography department, a good physics department, less of a business school, but still, you know, we, we are competing uh, with the giants that typically they're coming from US. Okay, so what do I know from the rest of the team? Uh, so we do know that the radioactivity exists in the marine environment. We know that we we it's not something that's studied extensively. We know that we have much more knowledge of what's happening in the atmosphere rather than what's happening in the water. Um, so the whole idea was how on earth can we do radioactivity monitoring uh, in situ in real time uh, and is the, the ocean really sealed or there is damage to certain microorganisms at uh, given certain distances which is what where you, you simulate and, and you can uh, create some interesting results here uh, and where the next step is about human okay so uh, the, the, the decision makers, the stakeholders, they're far more keen and, and, and to receive information about health risks to humans rather than something that they don't necessarily understand, uh, which is a microorganism. And, and, and maybe they're even more, if, if that is fed through the food chain to a bigger fish, and then that fish is fed to a human. So they're very much interested in the food chain. They're very much interested in the actual humans themselves maybe a little bit less about because they don't understand how the whole chain works. If they knew, they would be far more interested. So we throw the human there, we put the health, we put the risk, and then immediately there is attention, okay? So the state of the art, um, it, it's, it's what I call fixed position, okay? So even in Fukushima, we'll have the, the last huge nuclear accident. What they do is they, 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 they go up to a few kilometers. Uh, from the shore, they put buoys and its fixed positions, and then they put cables, and then they put instruments there, and they keep on measuring, 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 and they keep on sampling, 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 get the sample. So it, it, it is fixed position. It's state of the art, but it's fixed position, okay? So there, is, there was always that, that fascination of mine that I believe uh, that if there is a stream, if there is a current in a river or in the sea that start taking things towards the direction, if you can sort of follow it, then that's magic. 
Of course, you need to establish that whatever you measure is which what's there and, and, and so on and so forth. But the state of the art is um, fixed position. And I have been arguing a lot and we have a very dynamic team in Ramones and we argue a lot about many things uh, as in any other project, but uh, we, we argue a lot about mobility as well. So I believe um, we had a very interesting discussion here with Lydia. She said, look, if you manage to measure, that's a big thing. And if you manage to, to guarantee that what you measure is what it is, that's a big thing. And then you visualize it big. For me, that's super big. If you add on top of that mobility as well, if you're able to follow something, then that's you know magic. Okay. If we do it fixed position, great. It hasn't been done. If we manage to follow as well, then maybe it's a different project. Okay, maybe it's a follow-up project. I I I, I was kind of pushing that that's the kind of angle because we have devices that are mobile. Okay, you will see from the technology that we have at least two devices that can follow, and there are two that are sort of fixed position devices. Okay, so hard science in blue and, and yellow, I mean, the, in the green area where we design, develop uh, information systems that they're trying to inform socioeconomic stakeholders, okay? So governors, governments, uh, cities, uh, funding bodies. Okay, and that's, and that's how it looks like. So at the moment, there is a source. It could be like the one we already had the first in, in Milos, where you have bubbles venting, you know, from a, a thermal, well, what exactly is that? Hydrothermal vents. Hydro -thermal vents. And, and those bubbles, they actually do, uh, you can measure it in, in them. And actually in the microorganisms that are around there, that's exactly what with that, we got samples, then we went further out, we got samples to, to establish the background, and then you can actually see eventually what's what is uh, is absorbed in, in microorganisms. At the same time, that will help establish if whatever the physicists were measuring with direct devices that were measuring what's, what's coming out from the source, if it's what it is, is what, this, what you find in the samples, if the same that the, and then you can calibrate the devices so they measure the same thing. Still, you are in, in, in one place here, okay? And you have that fixed device, that benthic lab that has many devices. Now, actually, we've made it a little bit more mobile. It's in, in an ROV and it can move. So it's not just super fixed position. It can move around. But the real magic is these things because there are two gliders, two sniffers that they can move around. They can move for quite a lot of time because they don't, they are not uh, battery powered. Okay, so they're they're gliding, uh, which creates new engineering challenges because they are not stable. They need they are like sharks. They need to keep on moving, so they are floating. That means if you're trying to measure, you are not. You know you you are keep on moving, so that creates another layer of difficulty in getting an and then it's how close you can go to the source and and how fast you can move back and forth, but no matter what it is, these can follow. And these, they are AI driven. So in real time, they're measuring and they can sort of see what they measure and they can start following the source if it starts moving towards a direction. So I, I think that's magic. But there are huge constraints. These, they can, they need that one, the floater up here, the floating device to be able to know where they are. So they are coordinating their movement through this, and, and this now, it, it's a two-dimensional thing. This is a, so it, it goes on a plane on the surface. These are 3D, they can go, and they can need to keep a distance so they can keep on communicating there. And no matter what they, they measure, they, I think at the moment, the modems we're using, which again, it's state of the art, they can only go up to 1.5 kilometers or something. So it's not like, you know, there's Fukushima and then something starts moving towards Los Angeles and you can follow it again, no problem. But still, it's a first step, okay? It's, it's a big first step than fixed position. So huge engineering challenges, huge instrument and instrumentation challenges, uh, huge uh, primary research challenges to, to address here. And then maybe a smaller issue up there. For me, I'm up here, you know, here, is the, you know, the bar is here, so I'm here. Uh, and in my computer, whatever they manage to measure, stamp from Lydia, yes, 
it's 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 the real thing, then I can get it up and and, and start. Ideally, forecast it as well as I will show. So not just measure and visualize, but also create extrapolations, forecast. Because if somehow you had annual maximum limits, you can say how fast you will reach those limits. And if you're, you're measuring weekly maximum uh, cumulative dosages and, and you find out that you're going to reach the maximum in three weeks, then you know the normal would be to reach it within a year, within 52 weeks. So you have something which steep and goes up. So maybe you need to inform someone. Uh, and big question marks, who? How fast? So similar like uh, situations where you have with, with major disasters. How, how, how far and who do you inform? So we have much better pictures now. So we have an amazing picture for, from, uh, uh, from Milos, but that's how it, it looks like. And that's one from Javier uh, up in Paris uh, from, from uh, something which is artificial, which is, which is a human. Uh, so somebody throw barrels with nuclear waste uh, and uh, so versus natural. So that's the two scenarios we are running. Uh, again, we have much better pictures now of these, but this is the kind of, of measurements and instruments we'll have within the mobile, the gliders and the, the fixed device, the Bentic Lab. Uh, so and that's how the the mobile path looks like. Um, I think last time I checked, loaded with instruments, if we lose one of them, it's half a million euros. Okay, so don't lose it. At the moment, we have them in pools. Uh, they, they behave very well. They have a, in, in, in Lisbon, where they do lots of experiments, they have a lagoon. So it's sort of protected. But if we go to Colombo, which is the, the Aegean Sea, then we are talking about 500 meters in, in the depth, so it's going to be a real. We were not going to lose it. So the the, the, the uh, our colleagues in in in, um, uh, in uh, Portugal they're very good at that at navigating this. But there are all the questions if it's going to manage to measure, and also bear in mind what whatever is in there it's much low power. You don't have the power to as the same you have in the benthic lab that in theory you could even have a cable from uh, the, the short to, to there. So you, you don't have the, the instruments that have the, the maximum accuracy. You have instruments that have less accuracy. So again, it's a big question mark. Whatever you measure from there, whatever you measure from the samples, and whatever you measure from the benthic lab, if all of them match. And, and, and um, these ones are meant to be the ones that will be the weaker signal, the, the weaker measurements, but that's the one we really need if we have mobility. So that's the one you, you should trust if something is moving towards the direction because you, you need to follow that. Okay, so that's the, the idea. So you see the spike and, and, and you follow. And you can do that in, in real time. We also have cameras. Uh, we, we, we can do hotspot detection. So again, in terms of instrumentation, in terms of what we're trying to do, if we manage to measure a really state of the art, Mobility, a question mark, and then what's going to happen in the surface, even a, even a bigger question mark. But that's how the, uh, the benthic lab looks like. Uh, but now it's, it's on top of an ROV, so that it's also a little bit mobile. So it's not as fixed as it looks. Uh, and given that the project operated during the COVID and, and post-COVID, we had and, and supply chain disruptions, we have big uh, issues in, in getting all these uh, devices, um, which funny enough, I, I met, so there's a company next to Durham, which they provide CZTs and they had the, the kind of software they were trying to get. And then I found out, okay, I actually know these guys without knowing that I know them. So again, in, in, in difficult times, you don't even you know, know where, where are the networks, but eventually you find that there are some people that are willing to help and some people that are not willing to help. Uh, Still, this is technology that that it's you know not uh, mature enough, so there is not um, enough interest there. But we're making the case that there should be far more uh, people interested in that. Okay, so where where do do I come and where do the things we do with um, uh, Theo and Lydia and Pavlos uh, come on the environmental intelligence front? 
So as I said, we have to go back to the book and see what on earth EU is defining as, as environmental intelligence. Uh, so it is the integration of environmental and sustainability research with data science, artificial intelligence, and cutting edge technology. So we definitely do cutting edge technologies. We definitely do artificial intelligence in the sense that these things are following whatever they find the source. They have to identify the source and, and follow. We definitely do data science. So to, today I've seen here about uh, simulations that they take thousands of hours. So we're definitely in the big data uh, analytics uh, here as well. And, and we have access to supercomputers. So, uh, but how on earth do we help the environmental and sustainability agenda? And bear in mind that because I'm in a business school, in the business school, we're trying to make things seem complex because they are not in a business school. So life in a business school is very easy. Uh, problems are very simple, but we make them very difficult. Okay, so if you ask a, a, a business school scholar what is sustainability, we'll tell you about that. That's a big thing. Okay, so we have at least twenty working definitions of what sustainability is, uh, and in a business school there are three dominant ones. Okay, so the the one is about sustainability of the planet, but of course sustainability of the business. Okay, so if the business, if this university survives in ten years from now, that's sustainability. So there's still an employer. So, you know, we have much more different and uh, more cynical ways to, to define. And then it's the sustainability of a product. So the whole life cycle of a product. So you buy this and then you recycle this. How do you do that? So, you know, it, it's not something. So we, again, you have to find when you see definitions like that, you have to then find, okay, what do they mean by sustainability in the European Union? And, and that's not written in stone, okay? So we go every year into conferences with the other five partners that I will show you. And we're still trying to understand uh, but the European Union forced us to get 2% of the budget out and dedicate it to this initiative. So we, we really need to actively uh, follow it, and we do. So the idea is that you do all that, no matter how you define it and no matter what, what, what resources you deploy, in order to cope with environmental change. Uh, and, and to that end, we believe that Ramones has a huge part to play, okay? because we are talking about radioactivity, uh, we are talking about, you know, I'm, I'm naive here, but Lydia is very actively talking about DNA change, mm -hmm. microorganisms potentially. So this, then they go through the food chain, maybe. Uh, we're talking about uh, swimmers investigating something, divers investigating something, and they go through and around the source. So, uh, and we're talking about also nuclear accidents. Okay, so we're definitely in the into the sphere of environmental change. Slow or fast, okay, in the case of an accident, fast, something anthropogenic, fast, something natural, slower, but it's happening, so we need to cope with that. So definitely it's one of those projects that are spot on in, in what the European Union wanted to, to, to deal with. So two scenarios we run at the moment, the anthropogenic and the natural. Uh, the anthropogenic could be drilling, like the BP thing, Okay, so whenever you drill, radioactivity comes out. Whenever you have uh, throwing a barrel with nuclear waste, eventually, sooner or later, something will come out. Uh, but then you have the natural scenarios, like uh, hydrothermal vents, like a volcano. Uh, that That's the, the, the two of the three test sites that we plan to go. Um, so the idea is that we will get measurements from various instruments. So again, you need to sort of understand that all these, they're measuring the same thing. So at the same time, uh, you, you, you're gonna, you, what happened in Milos, at the same time, at the same place, you get a sample, but also you have three, four different devices, uh, two from the fixed position benthic lab and two, the ones that will be on the gliders, measuring the same source at the same time. And then you're trying to calibrate, so all of them, they're measuring the same thing. Uh, so, and, and then it's, that's happening for many different uh, chemical elements and, and isotopes. And, and so, you, again, you, 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 it's very different for what you are talking about here, okay? So, uh, all these, they have different impact in different uh, microorganisms so, and, and human beings. So, um, we, we have the ability to measure for many different things. But then comes my question, 
So assume that we manage to, to calibrate the devices to really measure what it's down there. And we have the ability to do it for many different elements. Now, the story will go like that. So you have the, 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 the bits here, you have the C, then you have the nuclear factory here, then you have uh, Montpellier here. And somebody here with a big hat says, okay, I have some fish farms here. So A, B, C, D defines an area. Can you please throw your, your technology, throw your gliders and start measuring what's happening in there? So I have a sense of, should I keep be doing that or maybe moving those fisheries somewhere else? Should I be eating what's on there? Or, 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 or even if somebody is swimming here and that is two kilometers, give me some sense of what's what, how safe is to do so. Now, now I start having problems because that thing is a 2D thing, but the depth is a 3D thing. So that thing goes down. So it's a grid. Okay. And then I may have a glider that goes through this area and takes multiple measurements, assuming they are, they are calibrated and fine. It's the true thing. But it takes multiple measurements or in a high frequency. Of course, it makes no sense to go to, to this guy and tell you, look, every millisecond I'm measuring this. You, you lost them already. So it has to be something. This guy needs to be something like a, a time series that maybe it's every day or half a day. OK, so it's, it's much lower frequency. And what you need to show him is, is an extrapolation, a forecast. And then you need a threshold and say, look, in six weeks, which is where I'm now, I'm going to reach that annual threshold. And in normal times, I'm reaching that threshold within a year, in 52 weeks. So what do you do? You have six weeks to do something. Maybe you have six hours. OK, then you do nothing. Uh, so maybe I can move this. Maybe I can say no more eating if it's six hours. Um, maybe I say stop swimming there. Okay. So that was that was the original vision. The more we discuss in the project, the more it seems like the next project or the project after the next project, uh, which is which is okay, which is part of the game in a high risk, high gain uh, European project. But I'm still operating under the assumption that. I will build that interface, and if we manage to, to use it, that's fine. If not, we will still try to, to do that, even if it's used in a follow-up. But that, you know, and then comes the problem. So do you have this threshold? We are not sure if we have this threshold at the moment. So we are discussing of how we can put this discussion towards the, the agencies that, that they can set this. Many different countries, they have many different approaches on how they establish that. What we will definitely do or what we aspire to do is to make sure that these data points are the real measurements. And then I have good ways to extrapolate that. And then I can build distributions of these, and I can build distributions of the forecast, and I can build distributions of the forecast errors as well. Because I can also say how far away is my forecast every time from a data point, from the next data point. And then that will tell me how accurate is that six week gap that I'm finding here. And that will give me my chances to reach a certain threshold and be in a certain area that I don't want to be in that distribution. But it's the tail that tells me very fast you are getting into the area where you're reaching annual limits or whatever. Which, funny enough, is very close to the financial risk literature because they're also interested in the chance of a portfolio being somewhere there, losing a lot of money. And they call that value at risk. And we're sort of trying to create something which is called exposure at risk. So what are the, the chances of being exposed into? And then that's what we're trying to feed to the environmental agents. But that's a big battle. That's a very big battle to, to, to take. And, and that's why we say it may be the next project. But we are sort of, at the moment, borrowing ideas from financiers of how they quantify risk and, and we use that. 
So that's how, how the game is played. So one, one thing is, is the grid that we, you're having too many measurements, while for the whole grid, this guy only needs one measurement per day. So which one do you use from that? So I may have thousands. So I have to play with the worst case scenario, probably. So I will get whatever it goes around here. I will pick the maximum I managed to measure through all that grid. And I will assume the worst case scenario that the diver was next to that maximum at the right time, which was the wrong time, obviously. So wrong time, wrong place was there. So I, I have to operate under that. Or I can go under the an average scenario. I mean, so the system has a, a, a choices. You go for the worst case scenario or the average scenario, which means whatever you measured in that grid, get the average of all those measurements and assume that someone has been exposed to the average. Um, and then also it's 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 you know it's the direction which is very difficult to establish if we're going to manage to, to measure. So if if there is. Uh, an area which we can maybe sort of see through the cameras or start on measuring through the devices that are following. Big question mark if that will be able to be measured, if there is a current and takes uh, the, the water towards. And then we, do, we say we've seen it in the bubbles, we say we've seen it in the in the sentiment, but we haven't seen it in the water. So does it really matter if if, if it moves towards one direction? So again, Big question marks in, in the fundamental science here. Uh, and, the, and the other is the time frame. So you have the grid and you are observing it and it takes for the gliders to go around two days. But, but do you know that, you know, the diver was again in the wrong place in the wrong time? So again, I'll have to go under the worst case scenario. So, but unfortunately it was in the wrong place in the wrong time and was exposed to the maximum. Okay, and yet since that means that the diver was close to the source. But what was actually absorbed? Again, there my my my, my science is failing me, but there's a big science of how. And we're gonna play a lot around here in, in this very lab on, on simulating different distances and, and different sizes of organisms. And then not necessarily this guy, but you start from somewhere and you go up, but you need to simulate what is actually absorbed. Which again is a big question mark. And that's the first thing they will ask, okay? Because they, they will not want to evacuate anything and they won't want to stop eating anything. They will always be against banning anything. So they will tell you yes, but that doesn't mean that this guy absorbed it. Or this guy may have already cancer because he was exposed 10 years ago. And you know, I, I was playing in the rain when Chernobyl happened, and we know for sure that the the sky in Greece was full of, of things coming down because the wind was towards the south. So if I get cancer in five years from now, it's because I happen to swim there, or so it's it's very difficult to establish causality, okay? But that's why what we do here is very important because we simulate and we can see, you know, what what sort of. Uh, uh, so at this stage in this project, we, we aspire to do some simulations as well uh, at the same time. So apart from seeing that, then we can also simulate what these values mean at certain distances for certain microorganisms in terms of, of, of absorbing. Am I correct, Lydia? And actually absorbing. Uh, so we will have some scenarios there as well. Um, but the, 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 the direction and the time frame of the grid will we'll have to play with the worst case scenario. Uh, so that's the idea, which, which comes directly from this lab, that we will have to play for different size of microorganisms and different distances, and we'll have to play the scenarios and this is now is in the deliverable. So there is sort of a soft promise to the European Union that we will do that. So we will have to do that. Okay, it's already in one deliverable, in the last deliverable. So this is something that we firmly believe we will be able to do. Uh, another challenge given the architecture of the system and the connectivity 
is that those databases will have to be distributed. So I don't know when the glider will manage to, to communicate to the surface, apart from obviously navigating it, keep on communicating for navigating, but that doesn't mean at the same time, we'll use the power to, to transmit data. So I cannot synchronize all these things. So I have to keep storing the data locally in the gliders, in the Benthic lab. Uh, so at the moment, the database is, is, is distributed, but we sort of start discussing of maybe having one central database, which is something that I believe I will also deliver. I haven't promised that yet, but there is a deliverable coming in, in June, and I think I will promise that there and then give the architecture of the database. And, and what we are doing here also, it, it's compatible because it's an SQL database we're having here. It's an SQL database, I will promise. So we're sort of going to propose a centralized database uh, as well. Um, okay. Now, in terms of the actual risks, as I said, uh, the promise is that we have three kinds of, of, of uh, uh, time series. One is the original measurements, one is the actual forecasts, and then it's the actual forecast errors. In, 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 in the business school context, the errors are very important. Okay, in econometrics, well, they do give Nobel Prizes there as well. I, I don't say they're they of equal importance like the, the ones in chemistry and, and physics, but they do give Nobel Prizes in economics as well. So they play a lot around the, 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 these errors. Okay, they have been given Nobel Prizes on how do you go about uh, dealing with these errors and, and how do you, you base risk and uncertainty around this. So um, that gives us a good estimation of your chances to end up in that area too much exposure that, that uh, you don't want to be there. So that's what I have promised. And that's what I will definitely implement. Uh, so three different options in the system, which distribution you want to follow and based on which uh, you want to, uh, now you will tell me how on earth the, the mayor of Marseille will know which one to, to use, but I'm assuming there will be some uh, technically equipped uh, advisors that will help and, and explain the differences between playing with the original data or forecast on the original data. But we have alternatives there. And, and the story is following the literature on value at risk and defining that, that new metric, which is exposure at risk, uh, which is not necessarily absorption at risk. So it doesn't mean whatever you have been exposed in two meters that, that has been absorbed. So again, you could have different distributions from from your simulation from what was actually exposed and how that looks like to what has been absorbed and what that looks like. And it would be very nice to see the two distributions next to each other, what, what was, has been the exposure and what has probably, which may be flatter or different than what has been actually absorbed. But that would be a nice thing to visualize. Uh, I have been playing with my friends here. So the system is called Poisson uh, and Poison, so it's it's a poison and a fish. So it's a fish that has been exposed to poison. So be careful when you're eating your fish. Uh, but obviously we play with backronyms here. So it's a prototype information system for, for whatever stakeholders are out there, which still we are not even sure who these stakeholders are. So we know for sure the EU, the EU is, is interested because it's funding us, but we don't know um, who actually in the local governments are the ones that would be keen to receive and interpret that kind of information. Uh, the architecture of the system, it, it's much easier than the architecture of the actual um, engineering system that we have here, but essentially each of those have a small database and they have communicating abilities. Uh, and they have, we, we sort of already built an asynchronous interface. So we, we have an asynchronous repository where everybody's throwing the data. And then you can go there and see whatever has been managed to be uh, deposited in that repository and, and sort of get the information. Ideally, in real time, you should have from many different devices for a certain uh, area measurements from multiple sources. And then given the calibrations, you, you assume and you are able to say what are the real uh, values in terms of exposure, in terms of the source. And then simulations about the actual absorption. The system, again, nothing, there's no innovation here, okay? It's, it's just implementation. So it's just a modular system where uh, you, you get your data, 
You can visualize them even in, in a geographic information system. And then one layer up, you have a forecasting support system. So essentially, you are able to use uh, multiple methods to create forecasts. And then you also have a, a, a parallel system here that calculates risks. And because that needs both the data you are measuring and the forecast, because it has different implementations of risk, it's somewhere that, that sits in the middle. And then there's a big question mark if you're going to have a DSS, a decision support system up in the government or a local municipality. So if someone will say stop using whatever has been fixed in that area for the next six weeks, if there is something that, based on what's coming out of here, will trigger decisions at the higher level. We haven't promised that. We, we, we sort of soft promise some disaster response scenarios. So we can sort of say that that's the kind of systems you will need. Uh, but this has already been submitted, so they know how the architecture might look like in, in, in a full system. But how automated you want that? It, it's something that you don't necessarily want that in their own hands. Okay? So, and, and, and again, politicians are very, you know, they are not risk averse. Uh, they actually take the risk. They never shut down a city. They never shut down, you know, whenever they get a, a hint for, you know, a major thing. They never immediately take measures. Okay. So many, many systems and software and hardware, and, and these are different, much more basic hardware and software in the C, but very effective. Uh, and then as it goes up, the software becomes fancier and fancier. At the moment here, they use Jupyter and Python. At the moment, I'm using R and R Signy. There is an aspiration to develop two identical platforms, one in R, one in Python, depending who is, is using, who is more familiar, but essentially it's the same code, okay? So no. And again, there is no big innovation here. There is a lot of uh, usability, but you know, if you try and publish that in, in information systems journal, it's the importance of the application that, that comes up, not any innovation in how the system uh, looks like. Um, these are the five projects that they have been funded with us, uh, four more and, and, and us, uh, and all of them, they have to submit joint deliverables to the European Union. So every project has its own deliverables, but there's every, uh, 12 months, there's a joint deliverable in the environmental intelligence. So we all need to report and coordinate what we do. And typically every September, we go to the Good IT uh, conference, which is an ACM conference. So it's a big information systems conference um, where we have a special session on what comes out uh, uh, from, from our projects in terms of helping cope with environmental change. Um, and it's sort of will create a joint vision about the blueprint for environment. So in many different ways, this is a, a test bed for the European Union, what will come out from these five projects in terms of driving the agenda of environmental intelligence. So it's something we very actively do and something where this university helps a lot. We, we, there are three only, although there are eight partners in this delivery, there are only three of, of the eight partners. So it's, it's one, that we haven't seen the impact at, at the start, but actually it's becoming bigger and bigger. So we, we're we trying to throw side, side, side resources as well from other projects to try to fund uh, even more people helping out there because that is becoming big and big, big and bigger. Okay. Questions? Any questions? Thank you. Do you have any questions for Hi, Theo. How do you plan to make your forecast? The sample forecast. Okay. Is there any physical knowledge or is this very no, no. physical method? That's a very good question. So uh at the moment Can you please repeat the question because I didn't hear it. Sorry. Yes. If if uh, the forecasts are gonna be done with any kind of assuming knowledge of the physical phenomenon that takes place, or it's gonna be dealt as a, as a pure time series, which you don't know. What it is at the moment we're dealing as as if we don't know so it's time series and 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 as you say it may be something that one could explain that there was a spike because x y and z happened and it's the moon in the wrong place 
it shouldn't be there and that's why it's happening. Just saying silly things there, but no, at the moment it's been dealt as a time series. There is a, a range of methods, but all of them, they're dealing with a time series. So there are statistical methods, there are machine learning methods, there will be one deep learning method, but all of them, they are agnostic of what essentially the time series is. And that's obviously a very good next step. But once you get into causality, th that's a very different war. So that's, I will try a bit for a project like that, but that's war, okay? And especially in the business school, that's war. Okay, the moment you start establishing what drives the phenomenon, in economy, it's very difficult to establish a deterministic law. Why yes. the yes. physical world is it, it is, but now go back to, to, to the simulations that Lydia is doing. I mean, was the microorganism at the right distance at the right time? Was the diver so unlikely to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? So it's not that I have a real time monitor where I know the you know GPS tagged everything in there. Um, so I also, there's a bias here. I'm coming more from the time series end because exactly I have been suffering from all the assumptions you will have to make and then some of them will not hold. And then- uh, It's interesting because in, in the field of, I come from volcano museum, uh, it's geoscience. Uh, in that field, we, 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 we usually use models, physics-based model and, and try to run process based on this. Yeah, and yeah. the community is very is not as difficult to go to the methods that yeah. you use in your field. It's a bit yeah. complementary. I, 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 I have I have I have experienced that a lot because I only once I only dare try publish something in disaster response to to an earthquake and and I was trying to show that whatever the model I was it was forecast method independent. So it doesn't matter if you use the most advanced method coming from geosciences or if you're using a time series model the idea is that you have the forecast no matter how you have them and then you have to start seeing depending how accurate are these if you are in an area where you have less uncertainty you sort of uh, can wait and forecast or if you have huge uncertainty you have to start bugging up resources early on because essentially you will never be able to so it's it's it doesn't matter and the paper was rejected because it was, you're not using the right method. I said, look, I'm only using the methods to, to get some forecast and then make the case for the next level. And you are hitting me in how I made the forecast, which is irrelevant in this. Get the best possible forecast. I can't just put a black box there and tell you I have perfect mm -hmm. forecast because you will reject the paper because I'm doing that trick. But I fully agree that there is a big battle there whenever you... And that's why very rarely you... We have a saying, you know, multidisciplinary multidisciplinarity is amazing in theory. In practice, when you're trying to publish, everybody hates it, okay? Because the moment you see a paper and it's not from your own, you know, pool of, of you immediately say, oh, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? So I, I take the point, I fully agree, but at this stage, we are dealing them as, as time series that are verified, uh, but we don't have any kind of uh, additional variables that come with them. Any other question? Never good competing with Lance. So. <laughs> I, I do have a couple of questions. Oh, no, no, no. You, you go home now. You go home, get some rest. Go on. Oh, first of all, uh, hi, everybody. Sorry for being uh, 10 minutes late. We had a, a commencement here. Uh, Costa, thank you because I've seen a couple of slides I haven't seen in the past regarding risk, for, risk forecasting. I have a question which I think it's rather important in our, the context of our project. The question is uh, basically around the way you perform and actually the Clermont Group is uh, leading this effort, simulations towards understanding the dose um, estimations. Um, I think the main focus right now is basically on uh, microbiota and microorganisms. However, um, I would like to see some comment or at least a point of discussion here um, regarding the dose assessment and risk uh, that go comes with it uh, to humans. Uh, fish is nice, microbiota is also very interesting because to the best of my knowledge, there's very, 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 very limited information on that in the depths of the oceans. However, uh, humans are a little more complex in that situation because you're deep in the waters away from community. You have to go to coastal areas to really have some kind of um, effect. So I would like a comment from the business perspective, if you can, 
but also if Lydia is there, um, that's a point that we need also. So Lydia is there, the one that should be there as well. The one that should be there as well is Theo, because we had a one hour amazing presentation before me and we were discussing exactly on these issues. So I'll let Lydia do the lead here. But Thank we had an amazing presentation of the simulations they are doing here and, and where we are at with it. So. Yeah, good morning, Theo. Yeah, for the moment, and in the project, we said that we wanted to focus on the dose rates received by some microorganisms. So we focused only at the moment on the natural radioactivity, so radioisotopes that you can find in natural radioactivity, and for the, the dose rate calculated um, uh, by energy deposited by alpha particles. If you want to manage then those rates to human bodies, <laughs> uh, then we will have also to look at uh, maybe uh, other radioisotopes, other particles, gamma particles especially, and try to figure out how to be able to compute that for human bodies. And it's um, um, for the calculation, it's almost the same, but we need to Maybe what we can do for Ramon S is to try to build a scenario uh, with an artificial radioactivity and uh, a dose rate calculation to a human body with a water attenuation and without any water attenuation. And this, we, we can provide that through simulation, uh, absolutely. And um, as we are working a lot also with interpolation and extrapolation, we could try to, to build something uh, around that and uh, provide uh, the impact at a low scale, at a lower scale, and also try to provide information about the, those rates to, to a human body uh, in the vicinity of the, of the outspot radioactivity. Yes, but it's... Um, it's totally different. Uh, yes, so I, agree. I fully it, agree. This yeah. is, I recognize that uh, I think the scenario uh, choice is, uh, of course, something that we have to discuss, but we cannot really cover everything um, from the simplest point of view of mine, right? Um, I think it's important to understand at least the limits to some to some extent, maybe upper limits, uh, as you said, from artificial, perhaps in the uh, radiation. Uh, or some kind of, I don't know, season 137 or whatever case we have at hand uh, for um, also protection against uh, accidents, potential accidents, or uh, anything that's a waste repository. Yeah, I think it's uh, we have to really uh, find some good agreement and work on that. And um, I really appreciate all the effort there because I know it's complicated. It has lots of parameters. And of course, uh, we have a lot extended lack of data in these depths which i don't know theo i don't know if you've seen uh, the software they are developing here they are doing amazing job so they, they... Uh, that, that i knew already but i haven't seen okay. it and we have a collaboration with Lydia. Uh, yeah yeah, yeah. so they, they and it's something that could be even uh, bridged with what we do in the poisson so the yeah, two systems could work together no they have very very many joint Yes. Uh, it's also SQL based, Python based, so the, the system will definitely be able to talk to each other. So it's very interesting how you simulate uh, what's happened to microorganisms from what is exposed. And again, the question of between exposure and absorption and then what actually ends up in the microorganism or the human body. So again, we would be able to simulate this and link the two, the two systems. Costa, I think this is very is important because um... You talked about the different models you might uh, perform during forecasting that doesn't really count in the end because you really have to be data driven to some extent. Um, I think, however, that we have validated models or validated simulations. It's quite important because it will give you a very nice focused path to follow. And then maybe it's not model driven, still data driven, but at least have some limitations left and right, up and down, maximum, minimum, whatever you want to say it. Uh, for just getting all the indices or the information that is valuable for the stakeholders. I'm looking forward to visiting next month to discuss that with uh, the D and the group. Sure. Uh, sure. So, given, given what I've seen, I will also try come for at least a day. So we, it would be good to have a, a bigger meeting here. So it's 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 the very good things happening here. Thank you, guys. This is really important. Thank you very much. So we registered the, the, the full seminar, so I will provide you the, 
<laughs> yeah, what we have, the, the video and all the stuff. And we will now organize a, a photo booth to <laughs> to provide also some pictures about the team and with Costas and all together that you can. We'll I have, have already provided some social media posts. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> We're already in the news. Okay. I picked the proper color, similar to the to your slide. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much for organizing that. So see okay. you. We see you soon, Theo. We end the seminar. See you, Theo. Bye, bye, guys. Stay bye safe. Bye, bye. Have a good day.